Man, that, were, that was nice. What are you doing after church? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Don't just smile and walk away. I'm going to hire you for an hour. Facial. I got a massage um, Friday. Maybe that's why. Yeah. No. <clears throat> I was told to drink a lot of water, but there is water and coffee. Right? Turn with me to Romans. We are in a, a um, new series that was birthed out of last week's, when I talked about the on-demand God, how we get so angry at God because he doesn't give us what we want, when we want it, and how we want it. And I had a lot of feedback on, you know what, I, I struggle with that about God, but I also struggle about this with God. And today is going to be called the boring God, the religious aspect, the rules, how um, you join... You join the church and you become boring automatically because you're a Christian. Was in, has anyone ever thought that before? When I was growing up, I would look at Christians and I was like, why would I ever want to be like that? It was like penny loafers, khakis, a braided leather belt, and then a Star Wars t-shirt that said, may his force be with you. And I was like, why, why would I want to be that? And if you have that shirt, I'm sorry, no offense given, but um, I want to talk about how religion despises me. I despise religion. I literally hate the idea of religion. I'm not talking about Christianity that, where that's categorized as a religion. That is fine. I'm talking about what religion has become. And what if I told you that Jesus never intended for religion to be the way that it is right now? So if we can get Romans up on the screen. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have, you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then, who teach others, do not teach yourself. You preach against stealing. Do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols. Do you rob temples? First point that I have, religion says... If I do good, God will love me. Have you been there? I have to do all of these steps in order to please God. I absolutely hate that idea. And relationship says he will always love you. Now I had, um, last night I had these notes on my computer. All I had to do was click print this morning and I didn't do it. So if you have your, um, iPad, um, phone, whatever you do to take notes, or you can take pictures, screenshots of the screen, or you can watch it again this, this Sunday. I apologize for not having them up there. I, I want to talk about the, um, the rules that we put in place to try to please God. I don't like religion. I don't, and I, I had some messages last night from loved ones when I posted on Facebook. I, my prayer is that I become the, less and less religious the more and more I, I fall in love with Christ. And I had this, these comments from those that I love that, that are in a religion that um, said, I, I hope that you're, you're joking and just trying to get people into church by those grand statements and I mean it if we look at let's do a little history lesson after Ezra and Nehemiah the Pharisees a lot they saw that people could not uphold the Ten Commandments they saw that people were falling short they were in bondage they were struggling with with things that God had put into place so they came up with more rules more laws 613 more rules, more laws, where they finally condensed it into a book, um, the Misnah, eight, over 800 pages 
of these new rules that man put into place instead of God. Because they were saying that these people are stuck. These people, they can't uphold anything, so let's put more rules. And there were 65 more laws, more rules, for the Sabbath only. So you take the Sabbath day, Saturday or Sunday, and they put 65 more rules in there. And Jesus came and he's talking to the Pharisees, and in Matthew he talks about how they clean the outside of, they're like a cup where they clean the outside of the cup, but inside it's hollow, inside it's rotten, inside it's moldy. How many of you have thought, Christians are hypocrites? I'll be the first to raise my hand. Nobody else, just me? Okay. All right, cool. Where they become a Christian and then they decide, well, now I'm better than you, and I'm going to tell you every single thing that you do wrong. And I'm going to put, I'm going to have rules in place. And then growing up, I realized at an early age, I could never, ever live up to these rules. I couldn't do it. How many of you have stolen something in your life? How many of you have lied about something? Those who didn't raise their hand, they're lying right now. Those, how many of you have, have lusted over something or someone? <laughs> That's a firm, I'm not going to say who it was. That was a firm shaking of the head. Um, in the eyes of the law, you guys are thieving, lying adulterers. And that's how we hold the standard of you walk into a building and now you're supposed to be held to a higher standard and it's literally running people away from Jesus. Why do I hate religion? Because it talks about what you have to do in order to get to God. Let's say that God is up here and this is me. What religion teaches us is that I got to try and try and try and try to get to God. Do you know what relationship says? Is that God knew we couldn't get to him, so he's coming down to us. But yet in religion, we forget about this. Can you imagine my daughter, if I told her, and I kept telling her when she was born, and she was little, and I'd say, okay, here's everything that I need you to do, and if by the age of eight, you've had a perfect track record, then I'll become your father. That's what religion is telling us is that we have, to, we have to conform to all these rules and laws in order for God to accept us. And if you're in here and you think, okay, I'm new here, and I, I man, that's all, what I believe, I, I apologize. I've said this before, I'll say it again. Christians make my job harder than any other group of people. Because we look at it as, I'm going to go into a courtroom, and I'm sitting at the defendant's table, and I have all these sins against me, and the judge is looking at me, and he was, he's saying, he's reading off the list of everything that I've done that's breaking the laws, breaking the rules, and then Jesus walks in the room, sits beside me, and says, put it on me, not Matt. That's what Jesus did. But yet what we're doing as Christians is we're getting up free. We have this freedom. We're getting up and we're going and we're sitting at the judge's seat and saying, bring in the next Christian. Bring in the next person. That's not what Jesus intended for us to have. People struggle to have faith because of the religion and rules that Jesus never came to this earth to establish. He came to fulfill the law. He didn't, get, came, he didn't come to get rid of the law. He came to fulfill the law because he knew. Do you know what the laws were there for in the first place? To show us how much we fall short. All those Ten Commandments, there's not a chance that we can keep those Ten Commandments. And Jesus knew that. God knew that. So he's saying, I'm going to be the ultimate sacrifice. We're going to move from law into grace. But there's so many Christians that stay in the law and they judge other people because of how they're acting. And we like to categorize people in two different categories, the good people and the bad people. And when we become one of the good people, we like to judge those who are less than us. 
Well, I'm not as bad as that person. Do you realize that's like trying to get your reflection in a, a puddle of mud? It's not going to happen. But let's, let's move to crystal clear water, face of Jesus, and we'll realize how much we fall short. And that's where we're at with, with the idea of religion. Is that God was saying, you could not keep this law. I had it in, in place to realize, how would we know that we're in need of a Savior if we didn't know we were drowning? How would we know that we're in need of somebody coming to rescue us if we didn't know how we fell short. And this whole category of good people and bad people, do you know that God doesn't look at that? God says, God looks down and sees bad people and Jesus. And when you become a, a Christian and you accept the Holy Spirit, God, it says in the Bible that God sees the face of Jesus in you. So when God looks down, he sees bad people and Jesus. He doesn't see bad people and good people. But we do, don't we? Well, I'm not, I'm not really as bad as that person. I know what he did last night. And we're running people out of church. The second point that I have <coughs> that ties in with what I just said is that this. The... Um, the opinions of God are based on how others see us. That, that is why I hate religion. That is why I, I despise those who have become a Christian and think that they're now better than other people. I get this a lot. Well, uh, now you have tattoos. Leviticus says, you know, don't cut... Don't cut your body for the dead and don't get tattoos. And I'll tell them this every time. Do you, want to read the, do you want to read the rest of that chapter? Instead of just pulling something out of context, do you want to read the rest of the chapter? Where Three verses before that it says, Do not eat the flesh of any meat with blood in it. And don't eat any fruit or vegetables that haven't been cultivated for three years. And I'll ask them, do you, do you not eat meat? Well, I eat meat. Well, let's look at this in context. Do you, do you um, always make sure that the fruit has been cultivated for three years before you eat it? And the reason why that portion, the meat and the vegetables, if you look at the history, there's no refrigeration. So God was actually looking out for these people and saying, don't do this because I don't want you to get sick and I don't want you to die. Then you move to the cutting yourself for dead, the dead and the tattoos. And I said, do you want to know why he wrote this? Is that back in those times when people would die, other people would come and they would cut themselves for that dead person and they would get a tattoo for that dead person and they were worshiping pagans at the time. So the reason that God put that in there, he was talking about those who were worshiping pagans and they were cutting themselves. They were literally cutting their arms and letting the blood come out in honor of this dead person. And then they say, well, let's move to the New Testament. And Corinthians says, treat your body like a temple. I say, okay, we can, we can move three verses up on that one too. And it's talking about sexual immorality. Not tattoos. And I say to him, do you know in Revelations when Jesus comes in and he's riding on a horse, he's got blood on him, and he has a tattoo, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And they say, well, we don't know if it was a tattoo. I said, okay, I'll give you that. There's a marking on him. It doesn't say if it was dry erase marker. It doesn't say if it was pencil. <laughs> and they say, well, that's a stretch. And I'll tell him, that is less of a stretch than what you're giving me in Leviticus and Corinthians. Why? Why? It, it's not up to me to judge you for what, what you do with your body. It's not up to any other Christian. And you have not given the power to judge other people. But yet we do it. And it's because religion tells us you need to follow all these sets of rules and laws in order to get here. Do you know why I love the pulpit moved over here? Is because I'm no different than you. 
I just want to be, I just want to have a conversation about my Lord and Savior Jesus, how much I love Him, and how much I want you to come to Him. I don't want anything separating us. I was at a church in California, and the guy looked at me and he said, can I give you a robe to preach on? To preach with while you have on. And I said, a robe? What are you talking about? He said, well, you don't have your doctorate, so you don't get as fluffy as a robe. But you want something to put on you. And my pastor was with me, and my pastor kind of looked at me because I was speaking on my story in California. And I said, you know what? I'm, I'm clothed in the blood of Jesus. And he, he asked, what did that mean? I was like, wait, wait. Okay. But what he meant was, he, did not, he, he wasn't saying that he didn't understand what I was saying. He's saying, we're set apart from these people. I said, that's where you're wrong. The only person set apart is God, is Jesus. I'm no different than anyone in this room. I'm no different than anyone in any church that I go to and preach. I prayed on one of my tattoos. I prayed for weeks and weeks for the inspiration or the, I should say, approval for it. And what I got on my back of my arm was what they, the uh, warriors would put on their shields after Christ was crucified, and they would go fight in his name, and they called themselves warriors for Christ. Now, the first tattoo that I got, I just walked into a tattoo parlor with my new bride and said, I'll, eh, I'll take that one. That, that, that didn't mean anything to me. But we're, we're, we're no different, tattoo or no tattoo. And that's such a huge, the reason I bring it up, it's such a huge sticking point in society today. How can you be a Christian with tattoos? Because it's not about me, it's about Jesus. It's all about what he has done, not what I have to do to get there. Religion will tell you over and over again, do this, do this, do this, do this. Don't do that, don't do that, do this, and then you'll get to God. And relationship said, Jesus on the cross says what? It is finished. He didn't say, I did 90% of it, now do 10% in order to get to me. Do you understand why I have an issue with religion? It's because I was told over and over and over and over again before I found true freedom in Jesus Christ that I had to do certain things in order to get to him. And I said, I feel that that diminishes the cross of Jesus. Look at the scripture that we have. Can you go to the next scripture? By this, everyone will know that you are my, my disciples. If you love one another... Can you imagine if you go, if you're about to get married, and you go up to a couple that's been married 30, 35 years, 40 years, and you say, I mean, we're excited to be married. Tell me about your marriage. And they say, well, I hate her. You know, I'm, I just don't like her. I'm stuck with her. I, uh, every day I wake up and I wish that she was gone. But I don't believe in, I don't believe in a divorce. Do you think that me and my future wife, my girlfriend at the time, would say, that's so inspiring. Tell, tell me more. Tell, tell me more about what you have. No, but we have some, we have people who despise coming to church or following God, but they only do it because they think this is the only way that I can get to God. This is the only way that I can get to heaven. I want to go to heaven. I believe in heaven. I believe in hell. But if I don't do all these things, then I'm, I'm stuck in here. Guys, I've never had more fun being a Christian. Never had more fun. Why? Because it's free. Now, I'm not saying go out and do whatever you want. Paul says, should we go on sinning so grace shall abound? No. No. But God looks down and sees bad people and, and forgiven people and Jesus. But yeah, when, we, when, I, when I walk around and talk with people and they say, do you know why I don't go to your church? Or do you know why I don't go to church? Is because the same people that cuss me out Monday through Saturday come in and give me a big hug on Sunday and say, hey, I'm so glad that you're here. And I've been there. I thought I'd just come into church and I put on this mask and I show everyone this is, 
This is just what I do. No. If you know me outside of church, I'm the same person. Goofy slips up with my mouth, says dumb things, gets facials and massages. I'm the same guy. Always. Why? Because it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And we have to put the spotlight on him and not other people. Who gave us the right to judge other people? Religion did. Religion says, here's where you fall short. Now tell everyone where they fall short. I'm not knocking any other religion, but the veil was torn the moment that Jesus died on the cross, which meant those holy people that were the only ones that could get into to God and bring the prayers to God, those were the only people that could walk through there. If they were unholy, they would actually tie a rope around them and there was a bell, meaning God would strike them down, bell would ring, pull them out. Let's go with the next person. When the veil was torn, it, it 13 inches was the width of this woven cloth curtain that tore from the top to the bottom, giving us, me, you, direct access to God. I don't need, and this is where I have to walk a fine line, but I don't need to go to any other bishop, priest, counselor to have my sins forgiven. I have direct access to God himself to say, Lord, here's where I fall short. And he's saying, I know I died for that too. Is that I don't need laws put in in order to satisfy God. We treat the Bible like a buffet and say, I'm going to take a little bit of this and I'm going to add it over here. And this law that was back here that, that Christ fulfilled, we're still going to use little bits and pieces of this. And we're running people away. And we're not getting this faith that we need with Jesus because we think it's about this massive mountain that I have to climb and do all of these steps. And number, the second thing about the, uh, the struggle that I have with other religions is the secrecy. There is no secrets between me and God. There's no secrets that he has. I don't have to get to a, a certain spot worthy wise in order to come to my God he came to me and forgave everything and that gets us to point number three Jesus plus nothing equals everything Paul says this in Corinthians Jesus plus nothing equals everything but yet what religion tells us is Jesus plus no smoking equals everything Jesus plus Going to church four times a, a month equals everything. Jesus plus not cussing equals everything. And Paul was saying, because he was talking to these people who were saying, only circumcised people are worthy and holy. And he, you know what he says? He said, well, here's a knife, cut it all off then. If you think that that's the way to get to God, here's a knife, cut it all off. He's saying Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Everything that we have is in Jesus. It's not in how we act. It's not in how we live. It's not in how our bodies look, inked or uninked. Or if we smoke. Someone told me smoking won't get you to hell, but you'll smell like it. Okay? Let's go to the Bible verse that I have for this. Galatians 2, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I've destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, 
Christ died for nothing. If you don't get anything else from today, if you believe that righteousness is gained by your works, by how you live, by how you treat others, Christ died for nothing. Is that Christ came and he gave everything because he's saying it's Jesus plus me plus nothing else. It was everything. Everything. I know you don't like certain parts of the Bible. I don't. But those are the times where I spend the most effort on. Because I didn't write the book. But I serve a God that came and he died for everything. For everyone who would give their life to him. And I'm wondering if we... Uh, if we haven't been seeing God this whole time, but we've just been seeing this distorted version of God. What I mean by that is, and I don't believe in God because, I struggle with God because of all the rules. I, that's boring. I can't, I can't live up to that. I can't live into this religion. I can't, I, I can't do this. That's not the God of the Bible. So maybe you're not rejecting the true God. Maybe you're rejecting a distorted view of God. And those Bible verses that you're like, man, this, I don't, I don't like this. Just remember, the religious people are the ones that murdered Jesus. The religion murdered my Savior. He came and stepped on the toes of all the religious people None of this matters but the gospel. N none of it. I know it's important. I know it helps us build like tradition and faith. And, but if you look at it in the lens of Jesus Christ, the only thing that matters is the gospel, that he came to this earth to get to us because we could never get to him. And he gave his life for us. And three days later rose again because it was the only empty tomb in the history of the the world. Show me the bones of Jesus. It's not there. He rose again, defeating death. If you believe you can add to that, you're going to be trying the rest of your life to try to add to that. And it's going to leave you arrogant and prideful, depressed and disappointed. When you move from religion to relationship, it leaves you free, forgiven, and joyful. I've never experienced more joy than when I found out it's not about what I can or can't do. It's about what he already did for me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the one who came to us. Lord, I know there's people in this room that have tried and tried and tried to, to fix, to change a trait or an addiction or gossip that they have in their life. But we're going to keep on trying if we think that it's in our own power. Or that we need to find freedom in relationship. Not the rules and the laws that most of them you did not put into place. That we did. Lord, I pray that we get this. I pray that we understand that it's all about a relationship with you. It's not giving us free access to sin. But it's giving us a whole new freedom, a whole new love, a whole new idea of who you really are. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in this room that's ready to move from that into relationship with you, that today is the day that they believe in your heart that it's all about you, that you, you did all the work. You came to this earth, lived a sinless life, yet died my death, our death, for those who believe. With every eye closed, if that's you, moving into relationship today. Would you raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you this week. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Praise God. Praise God, Lord, that we can expand heaven and that we need to realize that others see Jesus in us. That we represent you, Lord. We are the only ones on this planet that don't live for ourselves because you are our white flag. You represent us. You have taken over. And when God looks down, he sees bad and he sees Jesus. 
Let others see that as well. In your name we pray. Amen.